All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, Simon is our next speaker. Uh, please welcome him. All right, so uh, my name is Simon Kornbluth. I'm a research scientist at Google Brain. And today I'm gonna to present our paper, Similarity of Neural Network Representations Revisited. Uh, this paper was uh, previously presented at ICML this year, um, and it's joint work with Mohamed Naruzi, Hong Lok Lee, and Jeff Hinton. So the motivation behind this work is that it would really be great if we had a way to understand the representations of trained neural networks. So why trained neural networks? Why not just study uh, learning algorithms? Well, so the problem is when we train a neural network, there's an interaction between the learning algorithm and some structured training data. We don't know the structure of the training data, um, so there's some limitation to what we can understand about how this trained neural network is gonna act uh, based on our knowledge of the learning algorithm alone. Ultimately, we need to study something that consists of both the learning algorithm and the data. Um, and so one way to do that is to try to look inside the trained neural network. Um, and so one approach to understanding a trained neural network is to look at its representations. And in particular, we can think about ways to compare the representations of the trained neural network. And this is an approach that has been very successful in neuroscience, which is what my background was originally in. Um, so I want to start by introducing kind of what is a representation. Um, so for the purpose of this work, when, when I say representation, what I really mean is a matrix. And the columns of this matrix are some set of features. So for example, uh, responses of neurons in some layer of some neural network. And the rows of this matrix are examples. So we pass some data set through the neural network. We get the responses of all the neurons, we stack them up into a matrix, and this is our representation. So I also want to say, uh, mathematically, it's simpler to think about this when you center these features, so when you subtract the mean across all the examples. So that's something that we do uh, in all the, the math throughout this talk. Um, so because we're comparing representations, we really need two matrices, X and Y, and these represent uh, responses in layers maybe of the same neural network, maybe of different neural networks, uh, but it's important that the examples here are aligned. So the number of rows in these two matrices is the same, and each row represents the same example, uh, but the number of features can be totally different. There's no requirement for any kind of alignment between the neurons. Uh, so next, let's kind of think about what similarity means. So the, the simplest definition of similarity between vectors um, is just a dot product. Um, but we also extend this idea to other kinds of inner products, so we can replace the dot product with positive semi-definite kernels. So now moving on to this idea of how to compare representations. Uh, the, the simplest way of comparing representations that we can think about is we just take every possible pairing of features between the two representations and we just measure similarity between them. So we, we take their dot product. And if we do that, we get this matrix X transpose Y there on the right. Um, but there's another way we could think kind of intuitively about comparing these representations, which is for each, each of these neural network layers, we can take the dot product between all possible pairs of features. So we can measure, or but all possible pairs of examples. So we measure similarity between the examples and not the features. Um, and this gives us this examples by examples matrix X, X transpose, um, it, it measures the inter-example similarities according to this neural network layer. So in machine learning, sometimes people call this a gram matrix. In neuroscience, we would call this a representational similarity matrix. So if we want to compare two of these representational similarity matrices, then the easiest way to do that is just reshape the, the representational similarity matrix into a vector, and then take its dot product with another reshaped representational similarity matrix. Yeah. Is there kind of like a nice interpretation of X, X transpose? Because X transpose X is like uh, the correlation between features, right? But this is correlation between individuals? Like yeah, so, so every element of this matrix is the dot product between one example and another example according to the neural network representation. Like, I guess I'm asking, is that like meaningful in a way? Because like... Okay, let's just have oh. that question on the other side. Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, I'm happy to return to it later. Oh, yeah, um, sorry. So 
it turns out that actually these two ideas are kind of the same thing. So comparing the features here, if we do it in a specific way, if we uh, take the dot products between all possible pairings of features, we square them and then we sum them up, uh, that's the same as taking the dot product between these two reshaped uh, inner example similarity matrices. And to turn this into a similarity index, we, we want to normalize it. And the normalization does two things. Uh, first of all, it makes this invariant to isotropic scaling. So we don't want it to be the case that the similarity changes if we just make one of the representations bigger. Um, and it also gives us a number between zero and one, which is convenient to think about. Uh, and it turns out we aren't the first people to come up with this idea. And actually, uh, it's been rediscovered several times under several different names. So in the psychology literature, it's known as Tucker's congruence coefficient. Uh, and more recently, in the machine learning literature, kind of a generalization involving kernels has been named centered kernel alignment. And I want to talk a little bit more about how to get this generalization that uses a kernel in place of the dot product. So the idea is very simple. We have these, these representational similarity matrices, XX transpose and YY transpose, and we just replace those with centered kernel matrices, K tilde and L tilde. So basically, we take the kernel, we compute the kernel between all possible pairs of examples, that gives us a matrix, and then we center the rows and the columns of that matrix, and that's kind of equivalent to centering the features in the linear case. So, Having come up with this similarity index, the next question is, how do we know if it's any good? And this is actually like a very difficult question to answer um, because there's not really any single definition of similarity that makes sense for all problems. It's kind of like similarity can mean whatever you want it to mean. And really what matters is what you're going to use it for. Um, so uh, one thing that we feel like is maybe the the minimal thing that you can ask for for a similarity index that you're using to compare neural network representations um, is if we have two neural networks that are architecturally identical but they're trained from different random initializations, we want to take a layer from one network and measure its similarity with all the layers of the other network and we want it to be the case that the most similar layer is the layer that actually corresponds architecturally. So in this example, if we take the third convolutional layer of a neural network, we want it to be more similar to the third convolutional layer of another neural network trained from a different random initialization uh, than to any of the other layers of that network. And so we can actually perform the sanity check, and if we do this with the, the linear version of CKA, which is what I was showing you earlier, uh, we get a plot that looks like this. So here, the X and Y axes are uh, the layers of two different neural networks that are architecturally identical, but trained from different random initializations. And brighter colors here indicate greater similarity. So you can see that the diagonal here is brighter than the off-diagonals, and that indicates that the architecturally corresponding layers are more similar than the non-corresponding layers. So beyond this plain CNN that's trained on CIFAR-10, we can also look at a ResNet trained on CIFAR-10 and a transformer that's trained to perform English to German translation. And we can see that in each of these cases, um, CKA passes this sanity check. The diagonals here are brighter than the off-diagonals, and we can recover the architectural correspondences based on similarity alone. Uh, we can also compare CKA to approaches that have previously been proposed to measure similarity of, between neural network representations. So here I show uh, representational, the, 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 the similarity between layers using canonical correlation analysis and singular vector canonical correlation analysis, which are kind of ways of measuring similarity that have been used in previous work. Um, and you can see here that you don't see this bright diagonal, and actually, like, a lot of the layers are very similar to either the first layer or the last layer of the network. And that kind of indicates that there are problems with these methods. Uh, and we can also take the sanity check and we can make it quantitative by saying, okay, we've got 10 neural networks trained from different random initializations. If we take all of the pairs and we take a layer from one and measure its similarity with all the layers from the other, how often is it that the layer with maximal similarity uh, is the architectural corresponding layer, the architecturally corresponding layer? And if we do that, uh, you can see with CKA, we can recover the architectural correspondences with over 99% accuracy, but with these other previously proposed methods, the accuracy is much lower. And so uh, you might be wondering, based on these results, uh, what is canonical correlation analysis, 
And uh, why have people proposed to use it previously to measure similarity between neural networks? And why does CKA seem to work so much better? Uh, and so mathematically, actually, there's a very nice relationship between can canonical correlation analysis and CKA. So the idea behind canonical correlation analysis um, is that we compute this first CCA correlation by finding some linear combination of the features from X and linear combination of features from Y such that their correlation is maximized. And the number that comes out of that is this first CCA correlation. Um, we can compute further CCA correlations by doing exactly the same thing with the, the restriction that these new linear combinations of features have to be orthogonal to the previous linear combinations of features. So that's, that's how CCA works. Um, it turns out to get a similarity index from CCA, you can sum up the squared CCA correlations and divide by the total number of CCA correlations, which is the number of features in the smaller representation. Um, and if you do that, uh, it's equivalent to taking the dot product between all possible pairings of principal components of X and Y with the principal components normalized to unit length, and then again dividing by the number of, of features in the smaller representation. Uh, so you can already see that this looks kind of like CK, um, but we can also write CK in terms of the normalized principal components, the eigenvectors of XX transpose and YY transpose. And uh, if we do that, you can see that the main difference is that in CKA, we're weighting the dot products by the amount of variance explained by the principal components. So CKA is placing greater emphasis on similarity between these components uh, that are responsible for more variance in the original representation. Uh, so that's all the math for this talk, but I have a few more kind of interesting empirical results to show you. Uh, so the first thing is that we can use CKA to measure similarity between architectures, uh, be between different architectures. So here on the left, I have neural networks uh, with different numbers of layers. So a neural network with eight convolutional layers, 10 total layers, and a neural network with 18 total layers or 16 convolutional layers. And you can see that uh, if you measure similarity, it's kind of like in the deeper network, the new layers are inserted in between the old layers in terms of what their representations look like. And you, you see there's still a diagonal uh, in this plot, even though the 18-layer network has twice as many layers. On the right, I'm measuring similarity between a 10-layer uh, plain CNN and a 14-layer ResNet. And again, you can see that there's some architectural similarity between the two networks. So finally, uh, we have this kind of serendipitous finding of that, that kind of demonstrates what CKA can tell us about what goes wrong when we train a neural network and it doesn't behave as we expected. Um, so we have this 10-layer CNN with eight convolutional layers, and it gets 94.1% on CIFAR-10. If we make it twice as deep, then it gets 95% on CIFAR-10. So this is kind of the typical deep learning story. You just make it deeper and the accuracy goes up. Um, but the problem is, if you make it four times deeper or eight times deeper, the accuracy actually goes down. Um, and so you, you could try to explain this in t terms of like maybe there are vanishing gradients, maybe there's something wrong with the training, but you can also just directly look inside the trained neural network and see what's gone wrong. And so if we measure CK this time between layers of a single trained network uh, in each of these plots, um, so we no longer are using pairs trained with different random initializations, now it's just one network. Uh, you can kind of see what's gone wrong in this, these really deep networks. So if you look at the two layers, or the, the two networks on the left, you can see that the representations are kind of iteratively refined throughout the network, and each layer is really only similar to the, the layers directly around it. Uh, but these deeper networks, which actually have lower accuracy, you can see that there are entire chunks of the network that all have very similar representations. And we can verify that CK actually gives us an accurate idea of how the neural network operates by training a logistic regression classifier on each of these layers individually to perform the original classification task. And if you do that, you really do see that in that very deep network on the right, uh, the accuracy plateaus less than halfway through the network, suggesting that there really is no meaningful refinement of the representation happening uh, in that second half of the network. So that's all I have for today. Um, thanks for listening to the talk. And if you're interested in code or in, in reading the paper, you can go to our website, ck-similarity.github.io.
Thanks. Amazing. Yes, please follow up. Uh, quick question. Uh, you know, oh, yeah, sure. Um, I guess, yeah, I'm sorry, I might have missed the beginning, but um, I think you were motivating something as uh, we want to find the correlation between examples in the training set as opposed to uh, correlation between features. Yeah, so so actually, I, I think this is the, the, the slide where you asked the question. Yeah. So you, you can think about how do we measure the similarity between the representations of two examples, and then you can think about like maybe we can compare representations by measuring similarity of similarities between examples rather than doing something explicitly in feature space. Mm. And so that, that's the idea behind this method, but it ends up being the same thing as just measuring similarity in the original feature space, at least if you're doing it with the dot product. Mm. <laughs> and um, this metric for similarity that you developed, um, I guess like it's just one possible metric, right? Uh, yeah. The, Okay. Yeah, so especially like if you go back to the slide with a bunch of math. Um, so if you look at CKA there, you can imagine like there are different possible weightings of the dot products between the principal components there. And, and there's actually like one way to come up with a similarity index with different weightings is to use regularized CCA instead of CCA or CKA. And we actually show that that kind of interpolates between the two in the paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does the problem of deeper networks disappear if you use ResNet or residual layers? Yeah, so we actually have a, a 56 layer ResNet in the paper and it doesn't have this problem. Like it doesn't have this issue of having entire blocks of the network where the representation is the same. Yeah. So one example is like the, we have a training model, but we actually want to quantize the primitives by the fixed point model. Yeah. So the the aesthetics is different, right? Yeah. So in that, did you do uh, the experiment for that case? So we haven't tried working with quantized networks. I mean, everything here is just with off-the-shelf standard real-valued CNNs. Oh, I see. Um, if you go back to the uh, representations that you had for uh, for transformer versus where you showed yeah. the diagonal, um, it's an interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the contrast seems very interesting. Do you have an intuition as to why? So the resonance you seem to have a. I mean, that maybe we can guess. You have, seem to have a wider sort of diagonal. I mean, because it's probably getting information back. But I just wanted to know if you had any, especially for transformer. Why why is it more dispersed? Yeah. So we have the. So both Transformer and the ResNet have residual connections. And for Transformer, you can also see that there's kind of this funny pattern where every other layer is similar. Um, and the reason for that is that in the Transformer, uh, the, the architecture alternates between these like self-attention and feed-forward network sublayers. And you can see that the self-attention layers are similar to other self-attention layers, and the feed-forward network layers are similar to other feed-forward network layers, but there's less similarity even between adjacent feed-forward network and self-attention sub-layers. Can, can we say then that um, um, blocking through depth, transform networks are more uh, less distinct from each other, the layers are less distinct from each other um, in that sense? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think that's true of all residual networks. Like, they're, at least if you measure them with this similarity index, you kind of see that uh, there's not as much refinement if you use the representation after the residual connection. Uh, and a dumb question. So you had a, um, you showed accuracy for for the measures, but is it, is it because the number of uh, so it's always balanced because the number of uh, features and examples are always balanced? Uh, it, which which uh, so when you yes this one this one yes so you're, so you're, the yeah. issue usually with accuracy in normal machine learning tasks yes. is that if it's imbalanced it doesn't really reflect. Uh, the performance. Yeah. Um, over here, everything seems to be balanced. Is it because it? Uh, is that why? Uh, yeah. So we're we're measuring accuracy of these dif different methods on the same set of CNNs. So we we train ten CNNs um, for different random initializations, and then we just apply all of these methods to that set of CNNs. Any other questions? Uh, can you go back to the diagram? Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, like I guess in the first one, um, I guess the, the the similarity between the self similarity between like layer seven, I think, um, and, and like layer eight and layer nine, they seem like low in comparison to um, the previous layers. Yeah. But uh, don't you like norm everything? So wouldn't it be the same? Uh, or so so I can kind of tell you the explanation for why that is. Okay. Um, basically, when you have two different architecturally identical networks trained from different random initializations, um, it kind of seems like as you go through the network, the representations become more dissimilar. Uh, and the reason for that seems to be that, like, so, so I can tell you one way to fix this, which is if you make the networks really wide, then all of the layers end up being very similar to each other. Um, so it seems kind of like there are differences between the different initializations that accumulate over the, the layers. Okay, so like uh, a narrow or deep network is expected to have kind of like divergent similarity. Yeah. Like short and wide would probably be. Yeah. Okay. Right, thanks for the question. Oh, did you have? Let's 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 kind of and move into the other uh, talk. Let's thank Simon. Thank you very much. Thanks.